Welcome to lecture 14 for CS182. Today, we're going to start a three lecture unit on learning based control, uh, which will cover reinforcement learning and imitation learning. So, so far, all of the deep learning methods that we learned about are focused on learning to predict. That could mean predicting the category of an object in an image from a picture, predicting the translation of a piece of text into a different language, or maybe even predicting words based on sounds for uh, speech to text. Right? These are all essentially prediction problems. However, when we deploy machine learning systems in the real world, oftentimes we're interested in using them to make decisions. When we uh, enter the domain of decision making, we're really dealing with control problems. And some of these control problems are you know, ones we might think about intuitively, like controlling a robot or an autonomous car. Some of them are more subtle, like, for example, a machine learning system that makes decisions for a large e-commerce company uh, on how to, how to stock its warehouses. There are a number of challenges that arise when we move from solving prediction problems to solving control problems. So, for example, in prediction, we almost always assume that our data is independent and identically distributed. We discussed this assumption at the very beginning of the course when we uh, talked about formulating loss functions. The IID assumption, the independent and identically distributed assumption, states that the data points uh, in your data set are distributed according to the same distribution, in this case p of x times p of y given x, for each data point. And each data point is furthermore independent of every other data point. So what that means is that the label that you output for data point 1 doesn't affect the image you see for data point 2. So if you misclassify the first leopard as a tiger, that doesn't mean that the second picture will change in any way. Now that might seem like an obvious statement for prediction problems, but in control it's very much not the case. So in control, for example, if you're driving a car along a windy mountain road, maybe making the wrong choice over here is perhaps okay because you still have time to recover, but if you make the wrong choice here, it'll lead to disaster. Furthermore, the choice that you make at the first position may lead you to the second position if you make a mistake, but it might lead you somewhere else if you don't make the mistake. So your inputs are not independent of one another. Your output at time step one will affect your input at time step two. This is very important because uh, the IID assumption in prediction allows us to focus on just getting the highest average accuracy over the whole data set. Whereas the non-IID setting that we have in control means that we have to consider different objectives. Another assumption that we usually make when we're solving prediction problems is that we know the ground truth labels. So for example, we might be given a picture and that picture is labeled as puppy. And the task for our model is to learn to predict the label puppy. In control, we might be given more abstract goals. For example, our uh, learning system might be told drive to the grocery store. But drive to the grocery store is not what the system should output. It's not supposed to output the phrase drive to the grocery store. It's supposed to output steering commands for a car that will actually cause it to drive to the grocery store. So you can say, well, what steering command is that? Your method needs to figure that out. So your goals are more abstract. So in summary, prediction problems have IID distributed data, where each data point is independent. Control problems, each decision can change future inputs. They are not independent. In prediction, we have ground truth supervision. In control, supervision may be high level in the form of a high level goal. In prediction, the objective is to predict the right label. In control, the objective is to accomplish the task. And uh, in, the in this lecture and the following two lectures, we will build up towards a, a reinforcement learning system that addresses all of these issues. But for now, we'll talk about them one at a time. So in today's lecture, we won't talk about high-level goals. We'll assume we have ground truth supervision and just focus on decision making. But then later on, we'll relax these assumptions. And I would just mention that these issues, um, they're not, they don't just come up in what we classically think of as control, like driving a car. In many cases, real-world deployment of ML systems has the same feedback issues, even if those systems are actually outputting labels for images. So for example, uh, you could imagine training a model to predict traffic congestion. So it takes in some uh, information about where cars are driving and predicts, will the traffic be congested uh, within the next hour? But then uh, you deploy that model with something like Google Maps and have people actually use it to drive and that will affect their driving patterns. So now the decisions of your system are actually affecting what we'll see next. And now you're actually in a control setting rather than a prediction setting. 
You might furthermore think that, that the goal of this uh, system might no longer be to make accurate traffic predictions, but it might actually be to intentionally influence the traffic so as to reduce congestion and improve how rapidly people can reach their destination. So many real-world deployments, even deployments of prediction systems, are actually control settings. So even if you don't care about robotics or autonomous cars, um, I think these lectures will actually be quite useful because we face many of the same issues when we deploy prediction systems in the real world and encounter this sort of feedback. Okay, so let's dive into the, the technical meat uh, of the lecture. I'll start off with a little bit of terminology. Um, let's begin with a, a model that we're all hopefully familiar with, an image classifier, a continent that takes in an image and outputs a class. And I will gradually turn this into a model for control. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to rename things. Instead of calling the input x, I'm going to call it o, o for observation. Why do I call it o instead of x? Well, we're going to have many more variables floating around when we talk about control, so it helps to use somewhat clearer terminology. So I'll call the image o. And I'll call the output a for action. It used to be called y, but now we'll call it a. And I'm going to call my model pi theta of a given o. It used to be called p theta of y given x. Why do I call it pi? Uh, well, because it's a policy. A policy represents how observations o map to actions a. And I guess the word policy starts with pi. Okay, makes sense, at least if you speak Greek. Um, and furthermore, we're going to put a subscript on a and o. We're going to put the subscript t on them to emphasize that they occur at a particular point in time. So at the first time step, you observe observation O1, you select an action according to pi theta A1 given O1, and that action then affects O2. So if you fail to recognize the tiger correctly on the first time step, then on the second time step, maybe you have an image of a tiger that is uncomfortably close to you. And maybe your actions are not class labels, but they're actual things that you might do. So, you know, maybe when you see the tiger, there's a correct response. And if you don't have the correct response, the next observation will be less favorable to you. Your action could also be continuous, uh, like you know, which way to run when you see the tiger, uh, in which case maybe you would output the mean and variance of your action for a normally distributed action. So OT represents the observation of time t. AT represents the action of time t. Pi theta AT given OT is a policy. Now, a policy is just a model. It could be a continent just like the continents we had before. So, so far, we haven't actually changed anything about the learning. We've just renamed these things. But now we'll start introducing some new stuff uh, to help us build a mathematical formalism around this. One thing that we'll introduce is a state. And I'm going to refer to the state as ST. And sometimes our policy will depend on the observation, and sometimes it will depend on the state. And when the policy depends on the state, we call this fully observed. Okay, uh, let's unpack this a little bit. What is state and what is observation? Well, if you see a, uh, a picture of a cheetah chasing a gazelle, the picture contains pixels. Your observation is the, the picture. But underlying that, there's some real physical system. That real physical system has some state. There's a position for the cheetah, a position for the gazelle, they have momentum, they have their body pose, and so on. So there are some underlying variables, maybe you don't, you're not given those variables, but they're there, that actually describe the configuration of the world. And that's the state. So the state here might be the positions and uh, velocities of the cheetah and gazelle. So that's the distinction between state and observation. And this distinction can be very important. For example, if there is uh, some car that drives in front of the cheetah and you don't see the cheetah anymore, the observation has changed. The observation no longer contains the cheetah. But the cheetah's state is still there. The cheetah still exists. And here's how we can make this a little bit more mathematically formal. Uh, but by the way, this distinction will be very important later. For today's method, so that we talk, we'll talk about the imitation learning method, it's actually not that important. But I want to describe it right now uh, because it'll be so important later. So mathematically, the way that states and observations interact can be visualized by means of a Bayes net. So many of you probably learned about Bayes nets in CS188. Bayes nets basically describe relationships between variables and, in particular, their conditional independence properties. Um, if, you, if you haven't seen Bayes nets before, don't worry, I'll, I'll actually I'll explain this. So states and observations are distinguished in the following way. 
a state satisfies what is called the Markov property, uh, which means that the state S3 is conditionally independent of the state S1 if you know S2. This is another way of saying that the state at a particular time summarizes everything you need to know about the system. So if you know the current state, knowing previous states won't help you predict future states. The state is complete. It contains everything you need to know. And that makes sense, right? Because if you know the position of the cheetah and the gazelle and their velocity, then you can predict where it'll be next. But if you don't know the position of the, of the cheetah, then knowing previous positions might help, might give you additional information. Or if you don't know the current velocity of the cheetah, knowing its previous position and its current position might help you guess the velocity. So just the position would not be Markovian, but if you have the position of velocity, in that case, maybe it would be. Observations do not obey the Markov property, which means that if I know the current observation, also knowing the previous observations might help me predict the future. So for example, if you have that car driving in front of the cheetah, your current observation might be insufficient to figure out where the cheetah is, but your previous observation might give you more information. So the state summarizes everything you need to know. If you have the current state, you do not need previous states. The observation in general does not. Now, ideally, we would like to have policies that act based on observations, based on camera images, and so on. Uh, and that's what we're going to have today. But later on, we'll talk about some algorithms that are very, very good algorithms in most ways, but that actually require you to have a state rather than an observation. And when that happens, I'll, I'll tell you. But in today's lecture, all of the methods we'll describe are perfectly fine with observations, and they do not need to know the state. However, the understanding of the mathematical formalism and the distinction between state and observation is generally a very fundamental concept in uh, control and uh, reinforcement learning. Okay, uh, a little aside on notation. Uh, so, you know, in this class, we probably have many people from different uh, academic backgrounds. Uh, some of you might have seen states and actions before, for example, if you learned about reinforcement learning in CS188. Some of you might come from a more controls background. Um, so the terminology for state and action, the notation SNA, was really popularized by Richard Bellman in the 1950s. But you might have also seen a notation where X is used to denote state and U is used to denote action. They mean exactly the same thing. So S is the first uh, letter for the word state in English, A is the first word for action, X is the letter usually used to denote an unknown quantity in algebra, U is the first word for control uh, in Russian. Probably. So uh, the X and U notation is a bit more commonly used in the controls literature. The S and A notation is a little bit more commonly used uh, in the reinforcement learning and dynamic programming literature, but they mean exactly the same. Okay. Um, so with that out of the way, imitation learning. This is the first kind of learning-based control approach that we're going to discuss, and it's very, very simple. It's simply, uh, in, in its most basic form, it corresponds to just using the supervised learning tools that we already learned about, things like convenance, to solve control problems. So as our running example, uh, since running away from tigers uh, is not something that we have to do in our everyday lives, we're going to use a different task, the task of driving a car. So uh, your observations will consist of images from the car's camera, and your actions will consist of whether you turn left or right. And we're going to consider a very simple case, uh, one where we are actually given data with ground truth supervision. We'll talk about the case where we don't have ground truth supervision later, but for now, let's just assume that a helpful human driver has spent a great deal of time driving around and collecting a data set consisting of the observations from their vehicle's camera and the actual driving commands that they issued, how they actually turned the steering wheel. And then we'll use this training data to train a confident that reads in the image and outputs an action just like we trained convenance to predict categories of objects and images, exactly the same idea. The basic recipe, this is sometimes referred to as behavioral cloning, is very, very simple. What is not simple is understanding when and how this approach will actually work for solving control problems. Okay, so the first thing we could ask is, does it work in theory? And in theory, the answer is unequivocally no. Um, here's why. Uh, let's say that this, uh, I'm going to present the, the intuitive explanation first, uh, but then I'll, I'll talk about the, the more mathematical and statistical reason why the answer is no a bit later. Well, let's say that this black curve 
represents a trajectory through time present in your training data. So in this example, just for visualization purposes, you can imagine your state is one dimensional, it's just a number, and the curve represents how the state changes over time. So you can think of it as basically a graph. Um, and let's say your actions are small displacements in state. So basically the next state is just the previous state plus the action. Um, in reality, of course, you would have many trajectories, not just one. In reality, you might have thousands or even millions. Um, but let's say that you train your policy, and you train it really, really well to predict the action from the state. Now, even a really good policy will make some mistakes. They might be very small mistakes, but it will make small mistakes. So maybe when you run your policy, the trajectory that it takes deviates a little bit from the trajectory seen in the training data. When it deviates a little bit, uh, the state that is then fed into the policy at the next time step will be a little different uh, than the states that it's used to seeing, right? Because it made a mistake, it gets something atypical. If you're driving the car along the, the, that mountain road and you're used to staying in the left lane, maybe you're used to driving in the UK, and you make a little mistake and you swerve just a little bit into the wrong lane. Now, what you're seeing is a little different from anything you saw before, and it's just that little bit more likely that you'll make a slightly bigger mistake. And when that happens, the next state that you see will be just a little bit more different than other states you've seen before, and you'll make a slightly bigger mistake. And these mistakes will actually compound. And in theory, they will actually compound quadratically in the length of your trajectory. So that is very, very bad. Now, where have we seen this kind of compounding problem before? We'll come back to this question. See, this compounding errors problem, this problem where when you make a mistake, you see something that is different from anything you saw in your training, we actually saw that problem before in a previous lecture in a very different context. So take a moment to think about that, make a guess as to where we saw it, and then uh, in, a, in a subsequent part of the lecture, I'll actually revisit it, and you can check whether you guessed correctly. But for now, let's talk about some practicalities. So theory says no. That's pretty bad news because this is a really simple recipe. It would have been really nice if it worked. So what if we disregard the theory? What if we just try it anyway? Well, it turns out that if we try it anyway, it can actually work. You know, this is a, a video from, um, from NVIDIA Research in 2016 using imitation learning to drive a car. And it does some pretty bad stuff, like, um, you know, it goes off the road a little bit, so you might say, oh, well, maybe this isn't working. But then they collect a lot of data, a lot more data, uh, in this case, 3,000 miles of uh, additional data, and then use the same recipe, and it does something reasonable. Now, of course, their video for this is, you know, it's a little bit of an advertisement. I think in reality it doesn't work quite this well, but it still seems to do some very reasonable things. So for something that's not supposed to work in theory, it actually seems to work decently well in practice. So we'll discuss how to actually get these things to work in the next part of the lecture.